Welcome to Propaganda Media Radio. This is Jason Tillman coming to you pre-recorded. As tonight is a very special night. Tonight, we not only have one interview with Veteran on Patrol, Lewis Arthur, founder of Veterans on Patrol, but we also have, at the second half of our program, we're going to have an unabridged interview with Anthony Potter. Last Tuesday, I went downtown Tucson on location and had two excellent interviews in a camp. As you know, our military veterans represent individuals who have vowed to keep us all safe and are made up of many who have made extreme personal sacrifices to honor that commitment to us and our Constitution. Offering our military veteran a personalized hand up while asking for their contribution in providing all people in need the tools for their own unique individual success or survival is what I witnessed. During my visit to the camp, it was evident that it ran on the idea that a person can reap much more benefit to themselves by helping others obtain the basic life essentials that many of us fail to appreciate every day. This program is going to feature tonight a pre-recorded, unabridged, and uncut interview, a very interesting conversation with the self-proclaimed patriot, Lewis Arthur. He is the founder and current program director of Veterans on Patrol. VOP is a tent city in our Tucson area where the homeless and undernourished that may be in need of basic services can get. The primary objective, though, of this camp is to recon the area, to seek out our country's most precious resource, our homeless military veterans. The camp seems to offer a, a real priceless personal therapy in the form of helping others, especially unsheltered Americans. Veterans on Patrol is a group of dedicated people filling the void where other organizations fall short. And they're doing things to help people on an all-volunteer basis. Lewis describes the funding for Veterans on Patrol to be a self-sacrificing organization, as he calls it, or abbreviated SSO. What makes Veterans on Patrol truly unique is that it's an outreach that actually reaches out while being embedded within our local communities in order to find all people who are in need of assistance, especially are many military veterans that have been neglected while seeking help through the many other means that we do have to offer. This uncut version of our interview will be different than the video production. If you're, if you're not familiar with Anthony Potter, he's one of the nicest guys you've ever have met. And I had the absolute pleasure of interviewing him. He's a houseless and human rights activist a blogger, and a photographer at Angry Mob Photography. If you're familiar with that name, Angry Mob Photography, that was some of the photos that were taken last show that we borrowed from Kuleem Stephen. Potter is formerly an active protester in the 2011 and 2012 Tucson Occupy movement and is currently an organizer at Tucson Homeless Bill of Rights. Anthony speaks with us about his experience and, his, and shares his thoughts of Veterans on Patrol, the Veterans on Patrol operations. Yeah! So I hope you do enjoy two interviews. So let's commence with the interview with Arthur Lewis, Veterans on Patrol. All right, sir, you got me. Good to meet you, Lewis. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, you uh, are part of Veterans on Patrol. Is yes, that sir. correct? How long have you been volunteering for Veterans on, on Patrol? Uh, we're going on three months since it was founded. Um, technically, I've been out longer. It started with a 22-day walkabout. 
that I started in Maricopa County to bring awareness to 22 veteran suicides per day. And I was going to live with the homeless veterans to tell their story while specifically advocating for Army Ranger Alex Carrero. So that was the walkabout. You were just kind of walking around meeting people and actually living, living on the Living the homeless street? with them. Um, okay. By choice. By choice. Okay. But to understand what they were going through, I wanted to experience it myself. So I just had my pack, my flag, and my Bible, and I went and lived with them. Uh, I had a Veteran Lives Matter sign, a Veteran Suicide Awareness sign, and uh, I would march up and down the streets. And one night, a camp that I had set up in the middle of a field, there was a couple vets with us, and then a grandson of a code talker, uh, this Navajo kid, and it got our camp got attacked by a Black Lives Matter group, basically. And I had the Veteran Lives Matter sign out there, so I don't know if something that they had seen earlier in the day, but there was argument whether it was black lives or red lives. So there was natives and blacks that jumped the camp. They hit a 62-year-old Vietnam vet, Nash, in the back so of they, the head. So they physically attacked. Oh yes, and they would. What we found out, what we found out on the ground was that veterans living on the streets get disability checks. Yeah. Um, they get money every month. A lot of them do, and they're praised. Especially our older ones, our amputees were getting knocked out of the wheelchairs on the streets of Phoenix. They were getting kicked in the head. Um, drug dealers would have kids go steal their phones. They would steal the phones from the homeless. Then the drug dealer would give the kid 20 bucks, and they would use that phone for a burner phone so they can complete their transactions. It was and one of the and we we caught a kid who stole phone right in front of our base that we built up in Alpha, and he ran it right into our back parking lot, right into our arms. You know, and he even told the police, "Well, he got picked up in the park. He's suspended from school." And the lady offered him 20 bucks if uh, he would go get her phone. And so he asked an old man on the corner, can I use your phone to call my mom? Old man hands it to him, he takes off. You know, and, and there are things like that happening, and everyone stands around, and nobody does anything. The police you know? don't do anything. Well, the police, that. what can they do nowadays? Look at what the media has done to the police, even the military. we got American patriots right now afraid that the United States military is going to hurt them. That's a damn shame. You know, the military needs our help. They don't need us to be afraid for, of them. They don't need us fear-mongering. Oh, no, Obama's going to send the militaries to get our gun. He's going to send the police to get our guns. I mean, look, the police officers on the streets, they're just like every other group. There's good and there's bad. They're just people. Yeah. And there's going to be bad within the good. And you're not going to encourage the good to stand up to the bad when you go out and demonize all cops as abusers, all cops as, you know, bullies. I mean, that's not true. It's bigotry. Yeah. That's it's a, a double, double standard. Right. We scream about people saying that all of us American patriots are homophobic or, you know, all of us are anti-Islam. I mean, we get mad if we get labeled. But there we'll are go a out few. Say, there are a few, but it's, in all not, groups. it's not the full group. Though. It doesn't speak for the full group, though. And it's the same thing. You're saying the same thing with the police. Yeah. It's a small minority that makes the whole group look bad. And, you know, if it wasn't for the police, we wouldn't have um, even been able to survive the six moves up in Phoenix. We had so much support from the police out there. They were awesome. They knew what we were doing. We were out there defending homeless vets, getting the crap kicked out of them, getting robbed. We were also out there picking up trash. We were also out there trying to find housing for the homeless living on the streets. We were doing four to five humanitarian water runs. We took over 12 blocks up there. and We would go down 12 blocks one side, up the other side. We'd give everyone free water in our packs. Poor, rich, didn't matter. Everyone in the middle of the heat, you know, at the hottest part of the day, we were going out there to keep them hydrated. They saw what we were doing in the community, so they supported us. And that's what it takes. It takes people to stop talking about doing things, stop talking about all these great ideas, just go out and do them. <laughs> we don't have to blame the government for the failure when we can go out and solve the problem ourselves. Right. I mean, why blame the government? Well, it's, it's a lot easier to blame, to point your finger and blame somebody else for what you're not doing. And as long as you're pointing your finger at somebody else... You're not looking in the mirror and saying, what can I do to make a more positive impact? Well, we're judgmental, you yeah. know. And Veterans on Patrol is basically a weapon against apathy. It's a weapon against judgmental. It's a, it's a weapon against division. It is a round table we have built to where it doesn't matter what you look like, what you believe in, 
who you love, you know, who you worship, none of that matters. If you want to come help us find every homeless vet in the state of Arizona, we want you at that round table because you have ideas. And you know what? There's a veteran out there sleeping in the desert who fought for your ideas. And instead of putting you down because you have a different idea than me, I'm going to join you and go help that veteran who fought for your right to have that idea. Why can't we think like that as a people? Well, that's that's... I think that's one of the things that, that's really encouraging about what I've seen on, and heard about veterans on patrol. Because it boils down to this, treating people well, treating people with respect, giving people what they need. There's a lot of people, and I know you're not prejudiced. It's not just veterans that you're helping. It's oh, anybody, anybody in mind. It doesn't, and, and like you said, it's you're not... Uh, it's, it's not a prerequisite that they have to believe in a certain ideology or a certain religion or have a certain skin color. It's just, if you need help, here you go. That's great. That's great. So this started up in Phoenix? Yeah, it originally started in Phoenix. Okay. And then after Alpha Base was established, I came down here to Tucson, you know, because I was lived in Tucson when I went to go start my walkabout in Phoenix. I chose Maricopa County because it had the worst ranked VA in the nation and a veteran I was advocating for was in crisis in that county and I couldn't get anyone to help him. You know, he was being punished and he never did anything. Served 23 years, 9 months and he lost everything because his wife ran off with another man, took the kids, moved someone into his VA home. He retires in Army, uh, he's, he's the first sergeant, E8, retires E8, 23 years, 5 combat tours and he was homeless. He came home to no home and he lived on the streets of Phoenix for three weeks until a church stepped in. That's, that's sickening that we allow that to happen. We've got 22 veterans committing suicide every day. They're coming back to a nation that's destroying each other because you like Trump or you like Hillary or, or you know, you don't like Muslims or you don't like Christians. You know, it's just, it's got to be something. Yeah. It can't be us coming together to build something together, to do something good. It's got to be us dividing ourselves, you know, and fighting, you know. And, and it, it's egos, man. It's egos. And one thing that I love about the veterans as an advocate, you know, is they don't have those egos. The clear majority of them. They have this brotherhood. They don't have those egos. And when they come back here to a nation full of egos and they start assimilating to egos, they don't know how to act. Because that's not who they are. Right. You know, that's not who they were trained. That's not, they're, they're bred war fighters. Do you think this division ideology, do you think it's something like, uh, has something to do with the fact that uh, America is, is kind of purposely breaking, you know, causing divisions? It's kind of like that divide and conquer kind of thing. It seems like we're getting it from up above where they're trying to create these divisions so that way legislation and other you know maybe a socialistic agenda might be easier to achieve if because uh it's a lot easier to achieve that if everyone's kind of seg you know segregated well together we stand divided we fall i mean in the bible you know a house cannot divide it by amongst itself cannot stand Right. But who's to blame? I mean, I don't know. All I know is that... Well, blame's we not an important. Well, yeah, you know? okay. Is it a part of some uh, agenda? Well, you know, there's nothing I can do to stop it. You know, but what I can do is go make sure every one of my neighbors know that I'm their neighbor and I love them. And if something happens, you know, we need to rely on each other. We have people who need help. I don't want to fight with you over who you're going to vote. I'm not going to fight with you over who you worship. I'm an American Christian patriot, and I believe in liberty for all. And you don't have to say it's a libertarian or a Republican or a liberal. I'm an American. Okay, that's it. I'm an American. I was blessed to be born else. in America. I'm an American first. I'm an American. And you and see that's others everyone as Everyone else as an American. You may be a different American. And I've been in this sucked into the politics. I was horrible with that for years. I was one of those guys, man. I would say, you know, you can't talk to a dumbass liberal. And, you know, I had these, I knew everything, you know, because I was hearing the words of everyone else, you know, who's worshiping these few individuals. And they all turn out to be corrupt. They all turn out to be liars. They never fulfill their promises. And then we just wait for the next person to come and lie to us again. So if something wasn't right, you know. So, so at one point you were all for 
political process and oh, yeah. and, and and supporting a guy to come and save then us. Then I but, woke up because it's it's a, it's common sense. How many times does it have to fail to realize if you don't change something, it's going to continue to fail? Fool me once, Insanity. shame on you. Insanity. Yeah. You know, Fool me doing again. the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, and that's what Americans have done. We've gone to completely complaining about all of our government failures while at the same time we're using a voting process that I believe personally is, I mean, it's rigged. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, people are afraid to say certain things like, oh, well, there's some grand conspiracy. It's like, look, don't tell me someone got 108% of the vote of any county. You know, don't tell me, you know, that all this gerrymandering and all this pushing uh, boundaries over here and boundaries over there and this insider stuff, that doesn't represent America. Okay, all you're doing is manipulating an entire country and you want it to go left or right when what we want to do is go straight forward. I don't want to turn left or right. My mission's in front of me. So I'm not going to allow you to pull me to the right side of the spectrum or the left side of the spectrum. I'm going to the front, and I'm asking anyone who wants to help me find our homeless veterans to come out here and join me. You know, come on out here and realize, Americans, we don't hate each other. No, we don't. Like the way the media makes it. When I marched with that flat, I've had a Muslim put me in the best room in a hotel out there in Virginia at the Red Carpet Inn. It's on the Walking for the Forgotten page. Went and got ice for my blistered feet. I'm wearing... A Christian T-shirt with the Christian flag on it, carrying an American flag, a soldier's backpack, and a veteran suicide sign. And that man put me in the best hotel room. Well, I think it's sticking you know, to core yeah. values. I, I think um, people need to be reminded of their core values and then have to be reminded they have to live by them. You get back what you put out. Right. If and you if have- you're going to go out and put out a bunch of hate and negativity and arguing with somebody because they believe politically different than you, then you're going to get that coming right back from them. If you're going to go out to them and say, you know what, I love you, accept you the way you are, I'm not going to fight with you. There's no reason for us to fight. We got problems. What can we agree on that we can work with? There's a if, lot yeah, more. You can plenty. agree, agree there, on that. There's areas we can get together and solve problems, but we won't do it because we disagree on all this other stuff. Yeah, and so in your younger days, you pretty much thought, I think a certain way, I'm right about how I think, and everyone should think like me. Is that Would that be an accurate statement? I was statement? horrible until I had a child, until about six and a half years ago. I was from the dredges of society. Mm-hmm. My life is a testimony to God in itself, you know, and I don't care if anyone else believes in it. I respect their right not to believe. Respect my right to believe. I won't force it on you. You know, I'll sit and have an actual conversation with you because I am curious. I want to know what other people's ideas are. I want to know. And we can discount. We we just toss people to the side that have the very solutions to the problems we have because we can't see past a skin color or we can't see past a religious difference or Or a politician or a political difference. And that very person putting that person with you could go out and probably save 100 lives. So how, how, how did this change occur? I mean, I, I'm sure it didn't happen overnight, but I mean, how did you change to be from being very close and narrow-minded in your way of thinking to be such open-minded, uh, you know, with real Christian values? I got off of, uh, we pulled, uh, my wife and I stopped going to churches. I took a homeless man to a Baptist church, and the way they shunned him, it just, it, it, it I was done. It went against the Christian right. core it, values. It does. It, 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 it's. I'm not going to tell other Christians how they should represent Christ. I just know how I'm not going to represent. Him. I'm not going to sit there and judge a man because he's gay or a woman because she's gay. I'm not going to judge anybody. You know why? Because when I read the book, it says, "Judge not, lest he be judged." It That's says, "Love thy neighbor." It doesn't say, "Love thy straight neighbor." Love thy uh, uh, merry neighbor. Love yeah. thy political. It doesn't say. It says any of love that. the love, sinners. Yeah. Love thy neighbors. Yeah. Help the homeless. Yeah. So, so that's that's what I find uh, amazing, is uh, you know you mentioned the Baptist Church. That's kind of a religion of man, more than a religion of God. When it comes down to say the pure teachings of Jesus. And I, I would challenge <laughs> anybody in the United States of America. To find a church like we've got in Arizona with the streets and the people we're helping. And you find a ministry where every day you see people smile. When you see them wake up in the morning and they had a safe night's sleep and they slept a full 10 hours and they're refreshed. And when they wake up, they have a warm fire and there's food. 
You know, there's water. There's a restroom for them. You know, they have a safe place. And That's thankful. the church. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be out taking care of one another. Not everybody can be an advocate for the poor, but there's other causes out there where you can get with other people and go and make a difference. It doesn't all have to be political. You know, if you're about the environment and stop complaining about stuff, start grabbing bags going out in the desert. We do that as part of our mission, is to pick up all the trash in the desert and to clean up the homeless camps. They don't have trash service. So our deserts are riddled with trash. So we're going to go out there and clean up their camps. We're going to get them new tents. We're going to let them take a little bit more pride in their environment. And then we're going to say, when we bring you food, have your trash bag. We're going to take it off, and we're going to take it to base and get rid of it for you. You know, it's doing things to help other people. And then once you teach them to help themselves, you just step back. So you teach them to fish. Well, well you give them a rod. Right. And that's the problem we have in the Patriot Movement is, you know, there's so many in the Patriot Movement, and it's like they've all got the best idea, and it's got to be this way, or they won't work with this group, or they won't work with that group, you know. And some groups you just can't work with, and I can understand that. There's some that we can't work with, you know. Um, just have moral differences, huh? Is that no, maybe they're why excuses. You can't work? I challenge them all as excuses. If your idea is so great, why aren't you out there doing it? Why are you on Facebook talking about it? If you really want to help your community and prepare your community, why aren't you going out there knocking on doors, talking to your neighbors about community preparedness? I operate a think tank out of North Carolina, Preppers and Patriots, dealing with building modifiable disaster response plans for communities. We built five freedom shelters in that state just by getting together with farmers and property owners and making a plan for families to evacuate themselves to, connecting families across the state. We didn't sit on Facebook talking about it. We went out there. We gave. We put on the free service. It, it takes Americans don't know how to talk to each other. So you would encourage people to try to look in the mirror and practice what they preach, not just preach it. Is that what? Is that a good summary of what you? I saying? would encourage them to go out and do something good for someone other than themselves and see how that feels. And I'm not saying that people don't do that. I'm saying if you're down, if you're in crisis, if you're a veteran, if you're a veteran and you need help. You know, it's, you know, there are people out here and you're needed. And one of the best things that we've seen work is to see our veterans who are in dark spots come out to do a night patrol, a recon, come out, they find a homeless veteran. They're helping their brothers and sisters and to see that they have a purpose. And at the same time they're helping others, they're indirectly helping themselves. Yes, because we can put their trainings and leaderships to the use out here. We do patrols, we do recons, we do scouting, you know, we, we do meet and greets. Would you say that this kind of volunteer work is a, is a form of therapy for the individual? Yes, it's one of many ways. There's many ways we can heal our soldiers. No one talks about hyperbaric oxygen therapy in Patriot clinics. We've what, got a, what is that? Hyper hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's, it's hyperbaric. It's, it's, you're basically put in a hyperbaric chamber. It's oxygen therapy. What it does is it repairs brain damage. I mean, almost 100% of combat veterans have some form of TBI, whether it's mild or severe. Well, this is a non-narcotic, you know, this isn't something pharmaceuticals can make money off of. They're put in a pressurized chamber and, you know, they're given oxygen and they're, they go through 40 dives of oxygen therapy and you'll see their brains heal. Now, this is scientific evidence. We've got a neurologist in Tucson, Dr. Carol Hendricks, healing Arizona veterans. They will treat veterans with TBI for free because they care about healing their brains. And she does it without any pills, you know, and pharmaceutical companies can't make money off of that. But this is recognized in Japan, it's used all over the world. It's used in Israel, it's used in Russia, it's used all over the world, it's a recognized science. Oklahoma has Patriot Clinics across the state because the government made a law. And there are things like that most people are unaware of that will help us help our veterans. That's the but first, if, first if we don't get the message out to them, they don't know. It's wow. not mainstream media news. It it's not as cool. It's money. not as cool as who Kim Kardashian is sleeping with, <laughs> you know, or who the next hero is. Right. You know, it's. But in reality, at least in my mind, from my perspective. This stuff is, is way more cooler because this is the kind of things that make a positive impact in the world that we live in. It makes a positive impact on individuals. It makes a positive impact on 
your yourself, brothers and sisters and, and and as a result it makes a positive impact on who you are you can sleep with who you are it's yourself <laughs> i tell everybody we need them america needs our homeless veterans our poor our veterans in crisis our military our law enforcement you know we need all of them all the groups that are being demonized right now Everyone is being pitted against each other. You know, we need them all. They're all important. And they're, the homeless veteran and the veteran suicide epidemic is the one cause, you know, in years of studies that we've had that's actually most likely to succeed in getting a massive roundtable, a big coalition of left, right, everything you can imagine where everyone's coming together in just search of the Arizona homeless veteran. And, and it doesn't matter if the rest of the country does it. All that matters is us in the state of Arizona, you know, we're in a race. Anybody wants to challenge us in their states, and let's go see who can find the most homeless veterans in the shortest period of time and get them housing. Let's start, let's start competing against each other to build other people up instead of competing against each other to tear each other down. Because we can do good together if we set aside the nonsense. I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think uh, that's exactly what we need in this world today. And we're about to get a train. Yeah, so. <laughs> but definitely, I mean, that's, that's something that I think that's the cure that we need in America is people helping their neighbors out. It's don't be disconnected from your neighbors. Once the train passes, I'd like to ask you about um, fear of the neighbors. Thanks for the air you're doing great. I'm just telling the truth. Well, that's that's the other thing we need. We need some real down to earth truth to it all. and it doesn't like to let go of the horn. We got one that'll barely touch it. You know, it just, I guess some, somebody doesn't like us out here. There's an asshole in every, in every group. Yeah. So, uh, oh, what was the question I was going to ask you? Brain stopped. <laughs> I wanted to ask, um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, growing up, I used to hear a lot of people say, well, we can't really trust people anymore. It's not what it used to be. You know, oh, now we have, you know, poisons and, and razors and candy on Halloween. Um, what do you, th do you think that's more of a myth? I mean, you're dealing with all sorts of people, probably when it comes down to the homeless and stuff, you're probably dealing with drug users and alcoholics and people that are criminals, um, is there really something to fear in our neighbors or is that something that, uh, is there something to fear out there as far as getting closer to your neighbors and having that kind of community again where we sit and we talk to our neighbors and we look out for them and we help raise the children and you know that kind of mentality like I guess in the utopian ideals of the 50s how it used to be. I mean, is that something that is unachievable today? The only thing that Americans have to fear with uh, meeting their neighbors is rejection. And that rejection is something that's not even a realistic fear. Because if every neighbor was afraid of being rejected by the other neighbor, then you would have neighbors who would take anyone just to not be rejected, you know? So. Um, I think it's the fear of rejection. Um, we're programmed, you know. Oh, we've got 5,000 Facebook friends. Well, you let a disaster happen with your family. You'd be lucky if three or four of those outside of your immediate family and friends in your own area are there for you. You know, we have this illusion that we're connected to the world when we're really disconnected from ourselves and our own families. And it's the technology, you know. And with um, the convenience technology brings, 
you know, there are also other things that come with it that aren't so good. And we lose things like family values. We lose things like respect for each other. We're in such a rush, you know. I mean, God forbid the phone take more than 30 seconds to download a signal from space so we can see a picture. You know, we're so impatient. We're spoiled. We have everything handed to us. Yet here I am out here in the deserts of Arizona living with homeless people who survive with nothing. Who are grateful for everything they have, you know. If you give them a bottle of water, you'll see a smile on their face, and they'll be so appreciative. And they'll actually, you know, a pair of socks. I told everybody in the beginning, it was amazing. You put on your socks every morning. You give them a clean pair of socks after wearing the same pair of socks for a week. They'll take the old ones off, and they'll put them, and you just see them smile. You feel like a million bucks, just a simple pair of socks. We take things for granted. You know, and instead of putting down these people, we should be humbling ourselves, and, you know, and trying to learn from them. Because they teach you how to appreciate what we take for granted. They teach you how to survive what we can't survive without. You know, these people that are being put down on the streets, if a disaster struck, these would be the first people I would turn to in my disaster response plan because I know they're not going to freak out when they don't have their phone working or that the air conditioner isn't on or they don't have running water because they don't have any of that. They're already survivors. So respect them and love them. You know, because one day a disaster might strike and you may be dependent upon the very people you scorn, the very people you look down upon, and you better hope you don't get a bad one. The very people yeah. you wish they just went somewhere yeah. else, huh? Yeah. As a solution. Yeah. Wow. And, and you do feel, though, with our great co connectivity of social media and everything, you, you do feel one of the side effects is that we are a little more disconnected from the human element? Oh, definitely. We have, um, the thing with social media is a double-edged sword. It's the only media platform we really use unless local media wants to do a story. And uh, social media, it's, you've got so many people that are just on there constantly pounding on their keyboards, complaining, complaining, Running complaining. on the adrenaline rush yeah. of uh, But excitement. if you go to the Veterans on Patrol Facebook page, you'll see pictures of us helping over a thousand people in three months, over 50 getting into housing, so many reunited with their families, all this waste, youth syringes moved from the park, people who have been helped, people who have been victims of crime that we've been there, conflicts we've resolved, lives we've saved. I mean, Thanksgiving Day, a little girl running around, getting ready to hit a busy intersection. We're on our way to deliver Thanksgiving dinner to our homeless vets living out in the desert because they don't have um, the means to come out here. They don't feel like coming all the way out here just for a dinner and going back. We're taking it to them and here's a little girl. We pull over, we, we grab her, we go looking for her family in the community. We finally get the police out there and then, you know, she had snuck out. The mother finally comes down the street from a neighborhood, you know, and it's lives like that. You know, when we sit there, you feel so proud, like, you know, you know, the little girl's okay. It could have happened so many the other way if we weren't out here who knows what could happen yeah. and we feel like we're out here for a purpose because we continue to see people being helped and their lives changing I watched a woman go into an apartment today and that's what we get to see so much is people getting into homes that want homes and the people that want to be left alone we see them walking away with a smile because they've got a new tent a sleeping bag food clothes they let us know where we are and we're going to take we're going to take them supplies and check on them and you're doing all this on a volunteer basis it's all volunteer no we don't government get paid. funding the, no we're an SSO and an SSO is a self sacrificing organization when everyone started forming all these I'm a non government organization I'm a non profit organization we decided okay we're a self sacrificing organization we financed everything with Alpha up front and got volunteers and everyone to help build the base structure. You know, and every single thing that's donated goes to the poor. We don't have a fundraiser. I'm the founder. I'm the program director. So from top, I don't get paid. No one underneath me gets paid. No one shipping supplies to us or anything like that. Nobody gets paid. We're not. But, but you're uh, getting paid on a much higher level on a much We're saving more, lives. And yeah. how many of these lives have we saved they are going to go out and save other lives? You don't know. But I know when you're doing good, the potential is limitless. So putting and making a positive impact in the world that we live in, you make a positive impact on one individual and that in ideology should multiply. Your community. We're not going to change the country by marching on D.C. 
we're not going to change it by marching on our local governments. What we're going to change, the only way we're going to change it, if we shut off our televisions, we start talking to our neighbors, and we start doing something together. We start coming together. I mean, that's how hard is that? And if you're living in a country where you don't feel comfortable coming together with your own neighbor, remember, we have children. I have a six-year-old daughter. Our job is to leave our children something better than we inherited. And we're failing miserably. And we're going to draw a line in the sand. You know, I'll do it personally with my child. I'm not going to fail her. Okay? She's going to inherit something better. And even if it's just communities across one state where all these people are families now and they're no longer fighting and they're doing good, she's going to inherit that. That is something that I will have left for her. It's better than when I first moved there, you know. And we did this for you. So, I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. You're thinking in the long term. It's our children, long -term man. If it effect. wasn't for my child, I would still be walking with the devil himself. And I know how the enemy thinks because I used to be the enemy. I know how the manipulation occurs. I know how the mind games occur. I know how the psychological warfare occurs. And it's, it's, it's completely um, mind-blowing how so many people who say they're awake are still responding to the same news articles, the same stories, the same distractions. The same hype, the yet same erratic awake, emotions. Yet they're awake, but they're responding to everything the media wants them to respond to. With hate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there, there's no love in these messages. There's no love at all. And when do you build something with hate? The only thing you're going to build with hate is death, destruction, disease. That's, that's building with hate, and all that does is destroy. You build with love. And, and, and to say love nowadays in society, everyone gets this weird feeling like it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Oh, someone you, looks hippie. At you, someone looks at you and says, man, I love you. It's like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> I mean, we're all one people. We're Americans. We should love one another. We should be embracing the differences amongst us. Well, that's, you know? that's the core values that Jesus taught. You know, love thy neighbor. Not meaning thy immediate neighbor. Love everybody. You know, help the homeless. Yes. These are all core values. These are all core values. So, you know, definitely, Lewis, so much respect for, for sticking to those core values and emulating that in your own well, actions. Well, and, and that's one thing everyone um, needs to understand. And we I, I have to say this continuously because um, for my own sake and my own soul and, you know, for doing the right thing for my daughter, Veterans on Patrol can never be about Lewis Arthur. You know, this movement can never be about a person. You can never put me in the front of the bus. I use that analogy. I said, look, we got 22 war fighters abandoned suicide every day. You're never going to put me in front of them. You're not going to put me in front of the mothers I'm out here marching for awareness for. The moms of the 22. So many who don't have their stories heard, who are suffering in silence across this country through an epidemic nobody wants to address. All they want to do is talk about it and throw money at the problem when we need to be throwing people at the problem. I'll never be put in front of that. I won't allow it. I'll walk away before it even gets to that point. This isn't about Lewis Arthur. I have faith that every time I've been deployed, it's something greater than me. You know, since my awakening, you know, since my change, my conversion, it's been an awakening. And I go out there, and I know I'm doing the right thing. So don't make it about me. Make it about he who is greater than me, or you make it about the people I'm out here for. You tell their stories. You make it about the homeless veteran. You make it about the homeless poor person. You make it about the volunteers who allow me to be out here and help them. Every person who donates that case of water, who comes down and sits with them and volunteers, who treats them with the same love and compassion that we treat them with, you know. And I'm same, a clown here. Same, I don't love, yeah. same love and compassion that you would expect. Treat people the same way. That seems to be a core value of many religions, even the Muslim Everyone. religion. Oh, yeah. But it, it seems like we're get poly, perverted. We're they get perverted. We get perverted. And, 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 yeah. and I, 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 I ask my often. fellow Christians, you know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, um, you know, where are you? We're in churches. You've locked God away in the churches, and the church isn't even open to the public 24-7, so then you lock God's house out from society. You know, you blame the government for taking God out of school, but you don't do nothing to put God in the community. You know, and, and you, we judge. What are we doing judging people? How do you lead someone 
to a Lord and Savior you worship if you're out there telling them they're not worthy? Who are we to tell anyone that when we're not perfect ourselves? Well, I fail every day. Look, I've failed multiple times since being deployed. I'm a sinner. I'm going to sin all the time. Some sins are bad. Some sins, eh, but it's a sin's a sin. Right. Do you think God's going to judge me any less than what some other person does? You know, and who's any man to interpret the Bible for you? I don't listen to pastors and preachers and for a reason. You do I believe in false. I, I, the Bible is a blueprint for the individual. It's your personal book. It is your blueprint for God's purpose for you, and that's my belief. No one else has to believe like that, but that's the way I will carry forth with my belief. No man can dictate or, and tell me that this Bible verse means this. That doesn't come from you. Okay, I will get that. God will show me what that Bible verse means. But instead of debating these verses, we just go out and do it. We're not going to talk about loving our neighbors. We're going to go out and love our neighbors. Well, our We're not going to talk about feeding the poor. We're going to give them a <laughs> loaf of fish and a fishing rod. We're going to go do it because that is what I believe Christ would want us to do. You know, and if I'm going to um, em emulate anyone in the history, you know, of the world it would be christ that's what christ taught well, that that's exactly what christ taught and i i i, I thank you for that lewis i thank you i know it's not about you but i i thank you for it's a trap look conclusion. at how many great people were out there doing a cause and the cause was so great and it was so powerful and then they reached this peak and then all of a sudden they have all this fame, all this attention. Look, man, I want to be left alone when this is done. As soon as we get the bases built, I told you, I'm grabbing my pack. I'm going right back out there doing my walkabouts, living with them one by one. I'll be the guy bringing them to the bases we built. I'll be the guy out in the field taking orders from some other commander because that's where I love being. My job is to find the shepherds and put the shepherds in place and then go be a shepherd myself. I have my own flock to tend to out there, and I'm going back to them when this gets done. Yeah, it seems like that's part of the human condition. We have something that starts on good ideas, good morals. Once it grows to a certain point, it seems to be co-opted by evil. It's just yeah. part of, uh, and it seems to be, it, it, it's not prejudice. It, it seems to be across the board on uh, just about anything, whether it's religious, politics, or any group of people. So, you know, but you got to start these things. And, and yeah you gotta listen I mean there's so many people out there right now and they're wondering what their purpose is you know but you know just be quiet and listen for a minute and then when you get this feeling and you know you're supposed to do something you don't hesitate you do it you take a leap of faith if you're going out there to help another person you don't be afraid you're out there doing a good thing you're doing the right thing you well know? overcoming fears that's another core value of what Jesus taught yeah so. What's there to be afraid of? God be for you, who be against you. If you're not religious, you know, you, you don't fear death. You know, I mean, it's like, what is there really to be afraid of, you know, if you're doing the right thing? Well, and what good does fear do anyway in any situation? It cripples us. Yeah. That's what it does to this country. All the, all the information coming from the media, the majority of it is fear-oriented. It's to make Americans fear everybody. And why are we afraid of our military? Why are we afraid of our police? Why are we afraid of our government? Why are we afraid of our own neighbors? Why are we afraid of someone because they have a different skin color or they worship a different faith? Well, you know, I, why are we afraid of them? Why I are we engaging them? Because if you talk to them, you might realize, you know what? That's a human being there. And even though I don't understand everything and we don't agree on everything, if we can agree that we would love and respect each other's right to exercise their liberty in America, our problems would be solved. Instead of trying to conform it to what our idea of America is, you leave America alone and you leave everyone else alone. You let them exercise their liberties if they're not hurting anyone. You know? Right. Everyone has the right to be happy, to be free, you know, to be themselves. You know, we don't, we don't look for reasons to judge people. We look for reasons to help people. Start flipping it around on them and you'll see miracles happen. Is that what you think maybe the core values of our modern patriot movement in our country are or should be? Our modern patriot movement, they're, they're coming a long way from what they've been. But the sad thing is it's been a calling. It's, it's been the numbers. I mean... 
we're in the Patriot movement in almost every aspect you can imagine. We support constitutional militias. We support border groups like AZBR, Nailer, and them. I mean, we support anyone that's actively out doing something good, you know. And the numbers of the people willing to go out there and do it, they're few, far in between. And we can't seem to get people to respect one another, you know. Here, respect this house. I mean, your house, I'll respect your house. Together, we'll use our houses to accomplish this, you know. So it's like more of a sense of brotherhood. Well, we don't have that too much. We have an illusion of all these millions of patriots on Facebook. But what are you going to do, you know, when that power's cut? You're not even going to be able to check to see if you had likes on your last post or how many <laughs> shares you had. You're not even going to be able to know. And what are you going to do at that point? How many people around you in your immediate area do you even know by name? How many have you had dinner with? How many How many uh, are prepared? Are you prepared? You know, are you able to survive three, four, five days without electricity and food? You know? Do you have it means? What if it's something longer? I mean, you know, and we're spending our time living in this illusion while, meanwhile, reality, it's getting scary out here in reality, you know? Which and we're out scary. there trying to help people remove their fear. There's every reason for people to be afraid. Because not everything they talk about is a conspiracy. There is good and there is evil in this world. And to deny that is asinine. Of course there's evil. Of course there are powerful families, powerful entities in the global elite, you know, that could possibly, of course, it's common sense. Yes. Now, is there going to be some experience, uh, uh, plan to wipe out and exterminate the earth? <laughs> What's worrying about that going to do? Because there is, there's nothing you're going to be able to do with it if you're hitting that mouse and you're sitting there on your computer all day. Yeah. You know? And if you want to survive something like that, why aren't you out there building your neighbors up and making a plan? Well, yeah, and we want to take people's fear away. I don't want them to be afraid of our military. I don't want them to abandon our troops. Well, I think they got to be reminded that the majority of, of people are good. They really are. There's a small minority that's absolutely horrifically horrible. I used, to, I used to be in that minority. I know it's a minority, but that's all you see. You don't see the media doing all these stories. There's so many wonderful organizations out. I could spend 20 minutes just listening to them all right now. They're all doing amazing things. You know, um, most of them are not. We're we're unique in the event that we're all volunteer. We're not a nonprofit. We don't want money. We just want supplies. We'll be the boots on the ground. But you there want are other the tools groups. and yeah. resources to achieve. But what see, you're we to had achieve. the ability to do what other groups can't. What the VA homeless outreach team can't. What Project Action Veterans outreach team can't. We can go places. We can do things that you can't do. We can operate a shelter in a way you can't because we don't accept government money. We don't accept anybody's money. We have business from a private property owner to be here. We're under the Good Samaritan law. No one's getting paid, and we're helping people. So you would definitely be pro-encouraging people to use their individual skills to to make Believe the in themselves. Believe in themselves. And you know what? The best way to believe in yourself is to go out there and believe in someone else. And there's a whole lot of homeless veterans right now that need us to believe in. There's a whole lot of homeless Americans, women, children, our own neighbors that are suffering on the streets with no hope. They need us to believe in them. When you go believe in them and you see what happens to you and that person and that life and how it changes, you automatically believe in yourself because it was your belief in them and you had the power to save a life, to improve another person's life versus spending all your time arguing with the liberal or arguing with the right-wing radical. Who cares? That seems to have that belief and put it into action seems like priceless to the individual, to the person actually doing it. And it's only common sense to me because I used to be evil. I used to, you know, and I tell people, I, I, you know, you've heard it. I You're doing with the, the best devil. you can. So I know exactly, you know, the games. I know exactly the pitfalls. I know what they are, you know. I've, I've fell in every single one of them. I still fall in some every well, now and then. You're doing your best to change your evil ways, right? What more can you ask of anybody? I can say probably about 98, 99% of my evil ways are astronomically eradicated. I'm too busy out here trying to help people. And I might slip and fall on my face every now and then, but, you know, I jump back up. That's because you know human. why? I've got all these people out here who believe in me. 
depending on you. Yeah. Well, it's not so much that they depend upon me. It's that they actually believe in me. Which they believe in turn that you helps can do me good. believe in myself. And all I do is believe in them, and it's a cycle. And it kind of feeds that positivity. It's kind of like the... Um, Self-rejuvenating. Every action creates a positive yeah. reaction. Self-rejuvenating so community, if, basically. If you want to put a reaction to hate, it's going to create a positive, and that hate's going to grow. If you want to put a positive action yeah. in there, it's just going to grow out from that point. Well, now, as far as um, you brought up, we're at a, a private business owner. Yes, sir. He's allowed you guys to to uh, set up camp and to, to to do this great homeless experiment, which seems to be doing quite well. Uh, what kind of hurdles have you had with the city now? Uh, well, I heard... we were evicted off the first property. The eviction wasn't done properly either. They know that. We know that. We're not making an issue of it. Um, we understand the the initial reaction to us coming here. Oh no, here's a tent city, all these homeless people, all this crime. Um, remember when Safe Park took place, you had all those things that happened. So people were already, you know, no, not another tent city. And um, With the we understood, and everything. Sure. we understood, but we also tried to, the whole plan was, was just to come set up a 22-day mission and to go from the first of the month to the 22nd of each month and make a 22-day program and move from park to park around the city, help as many people as we can in 22 days, and move and go somewhere else. You know, but then HMS Fastener showed up, and then they had all this land, you know, and the owner wants to have a community garden for the poor. And he wants, he, he, he looked at me and he said, I want you to build a base for the poor. I, I, I met with them, I set a proposal out, and I said, you know, this is what we're going to do. He had trespassers here. They were homeless. Instead of having the police come in, we came in, mediated. We got them moved. Then we had to kind of move them over to another spot so they wouldn't be over in the city park, you know, because they had their needles all over this place. You know, know, and one 250-something syringes were moved since we've been out here. So there was a, a more of an evil element of the homelessness, probably. It wasn't so much ho- evil. I don't think so. I mean, Just I know, a, I know the individuals that have been living out here. It's, you know, they have addictions. You yeah. know what? They have their addictions, and I believe if some of us would believe in them, some of them could be saved, and other ones you're not going to be able to save them. But you still are supposed to care for them. You don't sit there and say you're not worth trying to fight for. Well, and those you know, are the people who need it the most, the yeah. ones trapped in addiction and dependence. There's, there's someone inside of almost every attic out there. I used to be one. There's someone inside there screaming, trying to put a stop to it. It's inside there. And if you've never been one, you probably wouldn't understand. But if you ever have, you know what that is inside. It's, it's, it's so small, but you can feel it. It's trying to break and stop. And it's trying to stop you. And sometimes it takes someone who like a former addict or a homeless advocate to go and encourage them you know and to break open you know and to make them believe in themselves that they can break their addiction it's kind of like a lobster trap addiction's a lobster trap once you're in there it's kind of hard to get out maybe if you get someone to help you out then it's up to the individual whether they're going to Swim our off, or they're going to go back in yeah, our job's to plant the seed i tell people we we open the door if they want help, we're going to go find the right door. We're going to open it. Once they walk through it, they're on their own, you know, with their decisions. Are we still going to be there? Yeah. If you fail and end up homeless again, do you got a place back here? Yeah. You know what? We're not going to give up on you. You know, we we, we know that uh, a pretty high percentage, like 64 to 70 percent of the people who ended up placed through VOP, you know, have gone back, left the shelter, or gone back into a shelter, or lost, I mean, but it doesn't matter. If that three out of ten is still out there in the home doing something good, then we've accomplished something and no one else has. We went on the ground, we found the ones who needed help, who wanted help, and then we saved the ones who needed to be saved, who were ready. And they got that chance. Instead of just writing them all off as bums, drug addicts, worthless, they're never going to be anything. We go and find people and believe in them, you know. And if three out of ten get off of the streets, well, that's thirty percent less homeless population you have. Because you're never going to end homelessness. So stop talking about it and stop wasting tax dollars on it. Yeah. It's not, you know, there's no, don't, they're not a problem. You, they talk about the homeless as if there's some type of problem that needs fixed. There ain't nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong with us. There is something seriously wrong with us that we would judge the freest people in the, in the nation. 
They're not living by our time schedules. They're not worried about mortgages and doing jobs they don't like and stressing out about bills. They can go wherever they want. And all they want is a safe place to sleep at night and be left alone for the most part. The ones that want to be on the street. And as a society, well, why can't we provide that for them? Obviously, paying, paying taxes and throwing money at the problem. Uh, you're out here because there's a void that needs to be filled. Well, see, here's the thing is, you say as a society, why can't we provide for them? This is what we're doing. We're doing it right now. We're in defiance of the city. You know, we're in defiance of the government itself. You know, we flat out said we don't need permission to help our neighbor. I don't need a permit to feed the poor. I don't care what you say. Okay, you're not going to stop me from doing my missionary work. And to me, this is missionary work. This is me going to plant the seed. This is going me going to be the good Samaritan. Loving my neighbor the way, and, and if, trust me, you want me doing good. You don't want to ever get me switched back to where I'm back on the other side because I'm very destructive. You know, you want to be encouraging me in this because we can do all kinds of wonderful things. And you want to encourage others. Because we're doing others. it. We're doing it. They can do it. Right. They can do it. We're doing it right now. Well, and I hear that from people. Well, how do you do this? And well, what about this permit and all this other stuff? And it's like... Where do you see us worrying about that? We go out there every day. There's three aspects of our mission. We find every homeless veteran in the state of Arizona. We help every poor person along the way, including the homeless veteran. And we provide a free community service, whether it's removing paraphernalia from parks, cleaning up graffiti, trimming down neighbor's yard, picking up trash. We provide some free community service for the community as a thank you for allowing us to come into their community and find our homeless war fighters. And that must know? allow people that you're helping to also in turn make a positive impact in in the society. It's paying and for not, it. Not be of uh, a burden. Right. Well, and then with um, like the city, the city said this this is only zoned for business. There's this is residents. zoned commercial Z3. And right. There is, there is one in the the city, I, I was explaining from the city from the beginning, you know, and it's, and this isn't um, a pissing contest between VOP and the city of Tucson. Um, for the most part, I can tell you You're not playing out, games. Yeah, You're not for, playing yeah, the pissing here, Yeah, here's games. the thing. Yeah, we're not playing the politics. We Party told politics, the city where yeah. we stand. They've told us where they stand. When they call another round table, we will go to that round table. You know, but the city itself is looking back, and I know that because they monitor everything, and they're seeing all these lives change. They're going to the page today. They're seeing all these vets go out to the VA. Vets get taken care of, getting put in the system. They're seeing a woman get an apartment. She's off base in a safe place off the streets because we were here. That's what they're seeing. And as long as we continue to show them that, they're not going to bother us. You know, right. we make the government our enemy by placing so much blame on their failures when we should be out there helping be part of the solution. Definitely. If crime's bad in your neighborhood, stop stop complaining about an understaffed, underpaid police department. Get together with your neighborhoods and start walking around and do community patrols. You know, and discourage watches. bad people from coming. That's all we do. We send out patrol units and we all have an American flags and we have combat yeah. veterans leading the way and that is a deterrent. Let them know that if you're going to do bullshit and or if you're going to do evil in my neighborhood, we're yeah. here to watch. Yeah, we're here to, it's to notice watch. and we're here to deter you from from harassing. Yeah, you don't blame. What do you? I mean, what does blaming accomplish? What does it ever accomplish? It's one thing, and it's hard. I'll take for the blame. Yeah. I'll yeah. take the blame. Now, can yeah. we get over it? Then exactly. we can work on something. You, you know. can blame me. <laughs> okay, now that we're through with that, now what should we do? <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, Lewis, uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Very much for this interview. Seriously, thank you for making a positive impact. Thanks for turning your yeah. life around. Uh, and and uh, continue, brother, you man. Thank him, man. Well, if hey. If you have faith, and if you don't, then you think you have him answer. right here, and yeah. that's what's really important, yeah. you know. And uh, you're not just saying it. You're not just wearing it on your sleeve. You're showing me in action that this is what you believe. I don't even have to hear what you believe. You can just come out and see. I can just come out and see, yeah. These are some of the greatest Americans I know. That's my church. And we're going to be here for them. We made them a promise. Well, this I would consider outdoors here, the church of God. 
you can go box people up into a building and pay rent and all this other stuff or pay for it and uh, that's only a religion of man and, and that doesn't seem to be as effective as uh, actually living a life of a religion of God. So You sow good seeds. So Yeah, reap what you sow too and it sounds like... Uh, you're reaping really good benefits. I'm so. watching these lives change. And, you know, there's always naysayers. There's always false accusations. There's always people trying to tear you down, spreading rumors. I've heard it all. I don't care. Well, that's you know, I've been a FBI, co-intel pro. I mean, I, I've been through all this stuff, you know. And half of the stuff I get blamed for happened to me. You know, and at the end of the day, it's like it doesn't matter because we're out here 24-7. And while they're still sitting there saying what a bad person I am or what a scam VOP is, we're continuing to help people. And you go find one person we've helped who's going to say anything bad about us. You ask the people we've helped. That's how you judge us. Judge us by our results. So you're not Go look even... at the lies we're changing. We're not going to engage with them. I just had to let an entire base in Alpha walk away. You know, but I said I was going to put it in God's hands, you know, and if they want to go the route of fundraisers and working with the city that lied to us and abandoned the homeless vets when we first launched, then let them go do that. Because who knows, I tell people, there might be some purpose that God has for them. It's not for me to hold on to. We built that base for the homeless veterans. If this group wants to go take it and run off with it, we've given them everything we've donated. All the money we sacrificed and financed for starting the first VOP base. Everything that my family and a few other families personally sacrificed, you know, it's all there. It's yours. Doesn't matter if you want to do it our way. Just go do whatever you want to do your way, you know. But, you know, you can't be part of what we're doing because you want a nonprofit. You want to raise money, and we don't want that. You know, we don't want that element coming in because that's when the problems occur. When the money minute is money is introduced, it's when it occurs. It turns these green. people into cash cows. Yeah, and then what are we doing? We're just making money off of the poor like everyone else. Screw that. You don't need money. We're showing you right now you don't need money to help them, so why are you setting up fundraisers? That's what I'm trying to get people <laughs> to understand. And these VSOs, like, we're doing what you're doing, and you're spending all this money and not achieving half of the results we're achieving. And by the way, our people are happier here on our base than they are in your freaking shelters. What does that say about your program? You know, if it's not working, you judge by the people that you're trying to help. How do they feel? You know, how, how happy are they where they are, you know? It's well, the focus becomes we need more funding. We're going to get more funding next year as yeah, long as money. we jump through these hoops. And this is what we need to do, so the focus... We throw money at our combat veterans. We throw pills at them. A pill, you know, they need a person who gives a shit about them. They don't need a pill that's going to screw their brain up. They don't need to be drugged up zombies, you know, especially our combat vets. They need to get the medicine naturally. They need some cycle they need, they need people to care about them. If they have brain injuries, there's ways to heal them naturally. You know, versus pills. Well, you know, they need to have their promises made to them fulfilled. None of this waiting six, seven months for this and eight months for that and a lost piece of paper. Now you got to go to a back. No. If you can cross this border and get everything free, then you can go and fight for this country, come back and get everything free. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Okay, we take care of our immediate neighbors first. We take care of our homeless veterans and our homeless Americans. And then once we take care of them, we go out and we help every other poor person that we can. That's what we're supposed to do. But we don't forsake in our neighbors to help other people, especially when those neighbors were forsaken, went and fought for our right to fight with each other. We don't right. do that. Right is right, wrong is wrong. We prioritize. There's nothing inhumane about me saying that I will be that if I had to choose, I would help the homeless veteran before I would help the homeless illegal. But you know what? I'm helping a homeless illegal right now. I take him food. I don't turn him in. You know where his camp is. He keeps asking us to help him get papers. I'm not going to do that, but I'll make sure you have food, water, clothes. You know, and I'll just keep an eye and check on you every now and then. Make sure. You know what? Three, four system. years ago, I wouldn't have done that. I probably would have called ICE and had your ass hauled out of here because I would have seen you as a leech on the system that's taken away from the homeless veteran. But what, you know, what we're, we're not out here to hurt how, people. How, how if, did, how did all you it takes that? is one instance of us thinking it's okay to hurt one of the people we're out here to help. How, how did you change that, that mind frame from going to that to a more humanitarian mind frame? 
I mean, what, what was it? Was there a, a, a tipping point? I had a child. I had someone that was to care about, about other than myself. And then, and then I cared the about what what I was going to leave her, you know. Well, wonderful. Anything else you want to say on the, the video or any, any encouragement you want to encourage people to... Uh, a, any other final thoughts, I guess? Or more, anything I'm more, to yeah. there, more than 22 veterans are abandoned to suicide every day in the United States of America. Think about that. Now, that is the government's number. It's 22 veterans a day. One veteran every 65 minutes commits suicide. That CDC report, if you look at it, excludes 21 other states, including Texas and California. So you can bet your butt that the number is a whole lot higher than that. But it doesn't matter if I have a banner over there that says 22 per day, because if you don't care at 22 per day, you're not going to do anything at 33 per day or 43 per day. So if the number 22 veteran suicides doesn't get your attention and make you want to pause for a minute, just to pause, then I don't know what to do. Because there's some disconnect that you have with your own neighbors. My job is to find a way to connect because they need every one of us to help them. And we have to stop fighting over everything else. Let's come together and fight for them. Let's let our veterans know we love them, we care for them. We love you so much, we're going to go find every one of your homeless brothers and sisters and we're going to take care of them. And if you want, we need your help, come lead the way. You know. Well, let me talk to you for a minute uh, uh, about suicide. Uh, by, the, by talking to you, it sounds like you've been personally affected by suicide. Well, yeah, and I think we all have. I know well, soldiers who've killed themselves. Um, I, a lot of my personal friends have been suicidal. I've been suicidal in the past. I think a lot of people don't so. really understand it. My, my, my story... Um, I grew up in Illinois, all my family's in Illinois. I had an 18-year-old brother uh, who had a nasty breakup, you know, uh, took a, bought a gun, went out and shot himself at 18, at 18. And I think the thing was, was the way that I saw suicide was more like a regular death, you know, something that you could actually heal after a year or two, you know, and, and move on. But... Uh, after I was in that situation where it hit me personally, I knew I knew nothing about suicide. And so I think unless suicide really affects you on a personal level, it's hard to understand the, I don't know how to put it, the, I don't, I don't think people can understand quite how it, it really does affect you to your core and rock you and knock you down. And it's something that you probably have to carry around with you the rest of your life. So, Suicide is, um, it's nothing that really can be described. And I've, I've felt the pain of the moms. You know, so many of them out there, they, they, I, I love you all. I mean, they know. I, there's so many of our mothers in our ministry that yeah, lost their sons and daughters to suicide. And, and a birthday, a special event, these are days of extreme grief, you know, and they don't understand. A lot of them blame themselves, you know. And I'm looking around at a country that's not doing anything to come together to help these families. They're too busy fighting with each other. Suicide's a difficult yeah. subject to talk about, I think. Uh, well, it is, you know, because at the end of the day, someone's going to walk away feeling like they're responsible and they failed that person and that person's dead because of them. That, that was a hard trap not to not to fall into, yeah. that uh, uh, you feel responsible yeah. because You could have done more. You, yeah. you shouldn't have noticed the signs. Uh, what else could you have done if you wouldn't have been so tough? You know, and you look to explain something that's really unexplainable, you know, and um, we stop looking for reasons to place the blame on suicide. I mean, because blaming is not going to get us anywhere. What we started looking was for purposes to prevent the next suicide, you know, to, to build in a platform and to doing something to get the moms, to get their voices heard, to get their stories out there. You want to do a great interview, you want to do a great documentary, you go contact the moms of the 22. You talk to the mothers and you interview them and you tell the story of their soldier who came back a hero, was forgotten about. Most of them, I mean, most of the ones we know, they all had problems with the VA and the system. 
and we have all these moms blaming the VA, with the VA staffed by their own neighbors, by their own community. So we don't even realize we're blaming our own neighbors. So would you encourage veterans uh, to come down here if they want to talk, if they have the courage enough to talk about this? Oh, I don't things? doubt uh, any veteran's courage whatsoever. They're the most courageous. They're war fighters. Well, it's you even, see, even and, as and, war yeah. fighters, though, it's so hard to talk about yeah. what's inside. Sometimes they feel alienated, like they're the only ones experiencing it. In your experience, do you find that to be true, that that it's isolated, or do you think it's more common? And, and if people were had an open discussion about how they feel inside on their suicidal thoughts, that you might find that you're far from being alone. Well, is that an option that works? Yeah. But there's also other options, because that option is not going to work on every other one. Right. You know, and so, um, just like with any program, there's no one answer there's no one program that's going to help every single individual unless that program is based around every single individual as individuals as, because instead of needs, fitting them into right. a mold so well, dealing right. with the veterans you know they're war fighters man they're warriors they need to be reminded that they're warriors they need to be shown the respect that they earn you know through their actions you know they need to be appreciated they need to be given a purpose you know, we've got plenty of purposes. We've got an unsecured border down there. I would trust that border with our returning war fighters, you know, who don't want to come back here and have to deal with the bloodshed and decisions they had to make and the lives and, you know, that standing on a border just doing watch and not worrying about, you know, a, a bomb, an IED or something like that, just keeping the border safe. There's purposes for them right there. You know, you come to Veterans on Patrol, you help us find your brothers and soldiers. There's purposes for you Kinda right there. Kind of gives you a reason to get up there, in the morning. There's plenty of reasons, we can, ways we can use our veterans returning. There's plenty of ways we can use them, you know. I mean, we, we need them leading our law enforcement, you know. We have the fewest amount of war fighters serving in Congress right now than we've had in the history of the United States. Yeah, they're and so anxious to throw us to war. Yeah, exactly. Why? Because you have the fewest amount of war fighters in here who know war, who've experienced war, and know that that should be the last ultimate decision if you can achieve your goals diplomatically. You know, if you can find some way to negotiate. You know, oh, I they, hate and, that. and I... they would be the last ones to vote going to war. And that's why you don't have war fighters in the great numbers that you need in Congress. We don't have representation. We don't have, you know, it's all lawyers and doctors now. There's no carpenters, there's no blacksmiths, there's no trades. It used to be every trade, every person was represented in the United States Congress. And now you're only represented if you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, or you're a pharmaceutical company. Well, I think following the constitutional uh, constitution as far as getting congressional approval to go to war by making it up to the people who have to sacrifice themselves, not just using them as... Workers, obedient we workers. We have no right to send any American soldier into war unless we're going to take care of them when they come back. Well, Period. I, 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 a story. I, I don't you think... You have we... no right to take my brothers and sisters and send them all to another country to fight if you're not going to fight for them over here, if you're not going to stand up and take care of them when they return. you got them coming back missing limbs. you got them coming back with serious health issues. You know, you got them coming back with psychological issues, brain damage, military sexual trauma. <laughs> we don't talk about that, do we? 53% of the men, or 53% of men are raping men in the military now. It's 53% of the rape harder. victims. And it's and it's hard enough to be a woman yeah. to talk about being raped that's in because the military. We look, that's because we look at each other as uh, we're either this or rather that, and we're all, instead of we're all Americans. We categorize each other, we identify each other as a white man or a black man, a Christian or an atheist, a Muslim or a Jew, doesn't matter. We identify people. You know, we put them in a box exactly. and, and then categorize them. And, yeah. and then we and if have I agree a with you guys, I'll let you over here. You guys I don't like, I'm going to throw and I might even go over there and fight with you. No, we need to have real values for yeah. each other and look, look at each other like we're family more than uh, a part of a different group, a part of a team. But that all goes in the silly games people play, party politics, pissing contests. I... We can be better as a people. And... The one way we can show, you know, our warfighters that we care about them and we actually do appreciate the hard job they had to do, whether we agree with the wars or not, we all agree they deserve to be taken care of, you know, let's go show them. 
Let's not sit and complain about the government or ask the government to pass another bill and more legislation and more programs. I want it. I want them to Let's not give them more pills and programs. Let's give them more people. I want Let's to, give them more self-empowerment. I want to quit sending them over there to fight wars. I want them to stay here and be a defense. We don't have any right to send them off to fight a war if we're not going to take care of them when they come back. Well, and, and I, I, I'm even before that. I don't think we have a right to send them over there without the approval of people. Because if the people really supported these wars that we currently have been in the last couple of decades, I think you would have that support you're looking for. You know, I I think what I know, and I mean what I think. Oh, I know that there are know. there are more American war fighters that don't want to be in war. There are guys over there, a clear majority, guys and gals over there right now that aren't fighting for a constitution. They're not fighting for a political party. They're not fighting for any of your ideas of freedom. They're over there in a bad environment doing an impossible job that they shouldn't be doing in the first place. And all they're trying to do is get back home alive and get their brothers and sisters next to them back home alive. And that's all they're trying to do is they're over there surviving. They're just trying to survive. We don't give them the tools to win. We got to keep the war machine going because it's profitable. And we're using our own brothers and sisters as pawns and then discarding them when they come back over here. We're drawing a line in the sand and we're saying in the state of Arizona, you're not going to beat up the homeless vet. You're not going to abuse the homeless vet. You're not going to do anything but love, appreciate, and show the homeless vet respect. Otherwise, we're going to kick your ass. We'll beat you up. You're not going to go around bullying them. You're not going to attack them. You know, you're going to help them and build them up and show them that we love them and we appreciate them. That's the way we should represent each other. Yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Thank you, Lewis. Welcome back. And we will be commencing with the interview with Anthony Potter after a short message from our sponsor and a musical interlude. Thank you for listening to Propaganda Media Radio. The Arizona Daily Independent, the oldest member of the American Daily Independent News Network, is proud to present this portion of Red Pill Approved Radio. The Arizona Daily Independent, along with the other members of the ADINN, welcomes citizen journalists willing to contribute the truth no matter the cost.
Welcome back. And we will be commencing with the interview with Anthony Potter. The only way we move forward is if the person fighting for public rights and the person fighting for private rights work together. Work together. Because okay. they have the same interest coming against them. Which is to help people are, are people in need are most in need in our country right. and so it's like if I choose if someone chooses not to be out here and they get into government housing go, the contract they sign with the government says that they cannot use that uh, apartment in any shape or form to make themselves an income they can't run a business out of there so, so do you believe in, in like, uh, independent entrepreneurship then? I think we're natural social creatures. And being social, uh, socially creative creatures, we automatically aspire to be what we want to be, whether it's a photographer, a lawyer, a politician, a banker, an artist. But you need a safe place to do it. You need a safe place to store your stuff. You need a safe place to assemble with other people. You need a safe place to do it, and you need to not have handcuffs on you. Part of the reason why it's hard to get out of poverty is that every single turn, you're either got to pay for something, or you're or you got to sign a paper saying you're not. Uh, if they work with you on this, you're not allowed to do this. So unless, no, and yeah, and, right. and there's so what you're saying is there's no way to go out there and make an honest buck like you can maybe on a black market that right. isn't so but regulated. But it's like the whole thing is, if I get an Obama phone, or, or what used to be called a Bush phone, but one of those government phones. Okay. I government go, help, right. basically. I go to the library. I get an email. I go to uh, one of the social uh, outreach places, and I get a bus pass. I get approved for housing. I now have everything I need to push something forward. I can use my food stamps to get stuff to make crafts. I can find different stuff in the community that's been thrown out that I can use to make crafts. But you're not allowed to make money while getting government assistance. Right. So you're 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 so allowed now, to have government help but you're not allowed to help yourself. Right. So we give people everything they need to sustain themselves but we don't let them use their own creativity and intelligence and and so social aspects to change their situation if i have an entrepreneurial spirit but i have signed papers and i get help that says i can't do that the only thing i can do is go work for someone else right I'm either going to be, I'm going to be one of those people who's either out here or indoors, but never getting out of that situation. But if I can get a way for people to contact me, a way for me to contact other people, I can get a, a place to put up a platform so that people know what I'm doing and how I can help them and how they can help me and a way we can work together. And I have a space where I can rest, where I could store different items, where I could keep my hygiene up, where I can cook food. Right. Then I have everything I need to exist and to you know, build something that's going to allow me to sustain myself. And what are we doing as a country if we give people the basic foundation we need so that they could aspire to do their dreams. We make them, we give them dignity and we make them feel equal and we give this opportunity that they wanted every night they were too, oh, they were way too cold. Every night where they couldn't get off of a piece of ground that's a hundred degrees or hotter. So are you saying that it's not so much throwing money at the problem as much as maybe the solution is to give people the tools to help themselves? Exactly. Okay. 
And so part of it is, it's like what BOP is doing, anybody can do. If they have the courage and and if they have the courage and the know-how, anybody can do what you're doing if they have the interest, if they have the creativity, and they can get the tools. Okay. So you definitely support what uh, veterans on patrol are doing, and it's like even though your ideology might be different. Well, it's like. I might be more liberal, they might be more conservative, but the basic idea is the same. The same core, you share the same core values. Right, it's knowing that we're all just people and we're all trying to get somewhere better, we're all trying to have a better community and we need a place to do that. If you get, go anywhere in this city, get a group of people who are like-minded in a space where they can cultivate their dreams and see what happens. That's how the 420 Social Club happened. That's how Tucson was created. That's how we got EGs. That's how we got all these news stations. When we, we did it, we got the railroads. We got these big monuments. We got all through, these buildings. Through collaborations and through encouraging, giving people right. the tools through to make it happen. small groups in the community who were like-minded, who had a space to cultivate their idea. And be encouraged right. to, and the tools given to right. actually make so it happen. So if you look at some of the think tanks they're doing in downtown Tucson, you got the Co-Connect and you got Startup Tucson and the, you got these different spaces. They're doing that same thing. The same thing is happening at the 420 Social Club. You get people in a safe place, they're like-minded, they come up with ideas. They perform different things. They become us. What what is the 420 Social Club? The 420 Social Club is a place, is a safe place for medical marijuana patients and to to come and medicate and share ideas with like-minded people, have fun and organize different events. And it's actually ran by uh, by an organization called the Fourth Avenue Cultural Association, which works to bring diversity and uh, social events, promotes local activities, and and gives back to the community. Okay. And it's ran by a lot of different activists in this city. And so so it makes it a place where, you know, if you're doing can if if you have a legal right to do cannabis, if you're in government housing, you're not allowed to do that there. It might be your medication, it might be what Helps you get through the pain. Helps you get through so the day. So it provides a legal, safe place for people to medicate right. themselves on if they're card holders. Right. Okay. okay. And part of what we're and it's like we're helping to gather signatures to bring about uh, legalizing recreational use. We're helping with as a we're a drop-in center for Op Safe Winter, which is ran by the. Um, by the uh, anonymous collective worldwide as a drop off for winter supplies if people want to help people so in the it's community. a clothes and, and blanket uh, it, it also another aspect of this club is it also helps donation efforts for right. clothes and blankets it, it advocates for vets it helps cr- be a place that where you could drop off supplies for uh, everybody out here. It, it, it's a place where some of the members help what we call the invisible disabled. The people that are disabled, but we can't, just by speaking with them and being around them, we can't always tell. Okay. And so it's helping those people, it's speaking at city council 
to make sure people are heard. It's organizing different events and it's helping local entrepreneurs have a low to no cost space to oh, sell their goods. Capitalize on their own individual right. talent space. Right. Okay. It's helping uh, and so uh, the nice thing is it's a place where we got people and we got space. So do, would you be uh, would you be for I don't know if you're aware of this kind of thought of an economic free zone to help bring up poverty? Right. Okay. And it's like it, part of the thing is businesses are struggling. A lot of people aren't talking about that. The reason why businesses don't aren't sure they want to help the homeless is because they're having uh, trouble helping themselves. Over 56 businesses in the past three years have gone under. Is our local Tucson businesses the new demographic of homelessness in Tucson? I hope not, but they're heavily regulated. They're heavily taxed. They're not given the tools. They're being restricted from right. the tools to, to prosper. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. It's like, so it's like, what do we do when the poor can't stop being poor because they're handcuffed? Businesses can't do more because they're handcuffed. And so it's like City Hall can uh, put a forum together for VOP to go and for a lot of other activists to go, for business to go, oh, and having a group discussion on what we could do to better the community. Okay. And the homeless want to talk about the, oh, what they need. The businesses talk about what they need. But everybody in there is there because they're either hurting or they're wanting to help and they got handcuffs. And government's an easy one to bag on. But it's like in that room, government's the one who's holding the key. That's asking who, uh, who knows how to open the lock. All right. It takes the people. Right. It takes and the people to kind of, kind of push the door open. Right. But it's the people who have to be the spontaneous social creatures they are to realize they're all in the same box. Right. And you help each other. You have the safe place you can grow. It, it's our worst fears and our biggest insecurities on a mass scale that makes up government. So if we want to change the government, we got to change the culture. Okay. If we're going to change, before we could change the culture, we got to prove the model in our neighborhood. We Anybody, need to change ourselves as right, individuals. Any banker and every, any right? stockbroker yeah. on Wall Street can tell you how to make money. Okay. What they can't tell you is how to make money without taking advantage of people. How to make money honestly. Well, and, and that's one of the biggest um, one of the biggest hurdles I see is if if you're in the homeless or houseless community, you can make money on the black market, you can make money illegally, you can make money in a dishonest way, maybe through theft or selling drugs or prostitution. But there's not enough there's not enough tools or outlets to make money in the same way, but in an honest way. Right, and so it's like part of what Sheriff Duknik always said, is if, when it comes to Tucson, if it wasn't for the Air Force Base, it wasn't for the university, and it wasn't for the black, the black market and the drug trade, Tucson would be a tumbleweed blowing in the desert. And Walmart. Walmart's one of the bigger uh, economic, one of the biggest companies that, that, that helps our economy too. That's well, just consumerism. Well, it's like the whole thing is if we're going to say people, tell people to buy local, what business owner is not shopping at Big Box? Yeah. The problem with Walmart is they pay low wages 
they cut corners and they fail to make promises. They always claim they're going to make 2,000 jobs. They're lucky if that store ha makes well, 400. I think, I, that's, I, I think it's in the top five. They're in the, the top five. I mean, some of the top five uh, employers and businesses are in the public sector, like, you know, schooling and, and stuff that is funded through our public uh, well, taxes. Tell me this. How did Walmart become Walmart? I think they, they became Walmart. I mean, I shop there, and I shop there for one reason only, because I can save, I can go to Walmart, buy $150 worth of goods and services, and it saves me 30 30 or $40. You know, they offer the best prices. But they're also one of the, the biggest, uh, they're one of the biggest things in our economy right now. But when you Google Walmart's in the private sector, then you also have like schooling and teachers. That's in a public sector, which is paid for by taxes. Well, have you heard of a, one of the newer stores called Publix? Publix, yeah. yeah. They have a very un Walmart like policy. They pay their people higher wages, livable wages. They make each one of their people a shareholder. All right. They have more people making management decisions. So are they successful by doing that? They are. Yeah, I, and I know. They're quickly becoming one of the big grocery chains. In in fast food, all fast food's pretty much a standard, and then you have In and Out Burger that pays their employees a little bit better. Right, but think about this: the way Walmart became the giant it did was they benefited from a three cent sell, state sales tax in Arkansas. Lower taxes? No, they got a nice chunk of that 3% in taxes. So let's say you create a sales tax that's three cents. Every one cent that you get for that goes to Walmart to help it grow and be a national chain. So they get tax breaks. Right. And okay. then every time you shop at Walmart, a big chunk of that goes back to Arkansas. The reason, part of what we need to do in Tucson is we need to grow businesses here. We need to help the average person. We got 54%, 54 to 65% of people in poverty. And we, we got, need more businesses. Do you think? Right. Do you think making more, it more? Uh, we get more think, businesses. We have more jobs. Okay. Do you think um, making it, making Tucson a little more accommodating towards business and business growth, like maybe cutting taxes or giving them tax breaks, it might bring these businesses in here? I don't think we should be bringing businesses in here. I think everything that has made Tucson great was grown here. Okay. I think we have enough brain power, enough will, and enough work ethic in this town <laughs> to build local businesses. And if we can help the average, uh, if we could help people impoverished, learn how to start a business and get a business grown. Entrepreneurship. Right, entrepreneurship. If we could help them with that. Let's give a tax break to local businesses already succeeding and help them incorporate so that they can grow. So that they can, or so that we can have a Sears, we could have a Walmart, we could have an Amazon, but we grow it locally. Okay. So rather than us importing big business, instead we export big business. And then everywhere that oh, one of those big box stores that happened that started in Tucson, everywhere they go, they some of that tax money comes back here. Okay. That's part of the reason why Seattle, Seattle. That's part of the reason Chicago, Chicago, and New York's New York. 
That's why Phoenix is Phoenix. That there's a reason why these com these cities grow bigger while other ones struggle. Okay. On top of that, another reason why they sh uh, why Tucson stays Tucson and Detroit stays Detroit and and uh, New Orleans stays New Orleans is that you have three companies that are called site selectors and they get in, in, in contract as consultants to different um, uh, businesses and, and local governments and so they tell local governments what big what businesses are best for their economy. So are you saying that it's the business owners that come in and then they get regulation that kind of uh, helps them become the monopoly? Well, the site collectors will tell Amazon, Tucson's not good for their business. Okay. You, you might want to try L.A. The they make it difficult for a the, company like Amazon to come in. The site selector is going to tell the city government, you want McDonald's, not Amazon. Okay. You can get McDonald's, you can't get Amazon. So they might, they might put restrictions on Amazon, but lift restrictions on McDonald's, because that's what the site director says. What they're doing is, for their own special interest, they're, they put... Uh, businesses in certain economies to keep them going strong and they uh, keep those businesses out of certain cities so that they can keep those as as an economically apartheid uh, areas okay okay and so part of the thing is why is Phoenix Phoenix and why is Tucson Tucson Part of that's the site selectors. Part of that is in Phoenix back in the 80s, they made it at a point to bring in business investors to Phoenix and help people become entrepreneurial entrepreneurs by getting them, to, getting people to one, getting higher paying jobs. Okay, or giving them, or maybe giving them the tools to make it happen, make it easier to well, be entrepreneurs. Well, it's like part of what you do is first you get people better paying jobs. Then what you do is you bring, when people are making more money, they spend more money. Well, I, I, I kind of differ but on that. It, it's even if they're like, not spending more money, they realize that they now have money to do stuff that they didn't before. I think I think it all starts on having a successful business. If I have a successful business and I can afford to pay my employees more, that's the only way that it can happen. I, I notice it's kind of like my house finances. I tried so hard to take care and, you know, upkeep my house and stuff, but I always kind of fall short. So when it comes down to paying, so I want to pay someone $15 an hour to do my yard, but when it comes down to it, I can't, so then I end up having to make the personal sacrifice and do my yard myself, because it doesn't make any, it, it, I make more money if I do it myself and bite the bullet. I don't want to do it, but I make more money if I do it myself, because I can't afford to pay someone else the wage that they're worth, you know, and so I, I think it's really tricky. I understand what well, you're it's saying. Like part of what I've done before is I've gotten a shovel and a rake and different tools, and I see someone needs yard work done but might not have the money. I go and clean their yard just because I know it needs to be done and they might not be able to do it. And so... I help that person that talks to someone else. That other person has money, but they want someone that they could trust. Right. Well, I got a reputation of someone who's going to do good work is just to help someone out, even if I'm not paid. Right. Someone is given that option between something else that's out there. They're going to go with that option. Sure. 
part of the situation is when you have the amount of poverty here. I can talk to all of my neighborhood, all the people in my neighborhood. If I want them to invest $5 into a business idea I have, none of them have $5 to give. They're all in need of $5 themselves. Okay. You go to another you go to another area of the city. People can afford $5, they could afford $10. Part of the issue is you one of the things you don't have anymore in Tucson is you don't have someone who is a jack of all trades living next to a doctor. You don't have someone who has ideas living next to a investor. I'm, I'm kind of lost on, on what you're saying. I think I'm kind of, uh, or maybe well, got like, off the trailer, or maybe it's just the explanation. I know sometimes when I when I talk to you, I know you mean one thing, but it kind of comes out a little well, it's different like, than it is kind of lost in translation. The average person out here doesn't have the same network as someone on another side of town. Well, sure. So if you're only as strong as what you're allowed to do, what resources you have, and what network you have, right? It's like part of what I was talking to, um, just uh, to um, what's that um, guy with the conservatives here in town, Kelly. Um, oh yeah, the the guy who ran for um, city council, Kelly. Yeah. Lawton. Yeah. Kelly Lawton. Yeah, I was talking to him, and I was talking to him about some of the legal stuff I'm working on, and he tells me, you know what? That sounds good. You definitely want to talk to an attorney, see if they agree. What's well, like part of I what I brought up to him is. I don't have that network. Do you know someone who's willing to listen, even if I can't pay it? Right. So it's like, part of the reason he can do what he does is because he has that network. Right. Part of the reason Lewis can do what he does is because he, he has, has that network. network. I have a network. Right. When we work together, we all have that now. We all kind of have to work with what we're given and, and the tools that we're got. Right. And, and the people that we're around. Sure. But we don't know that unless we say, hey, neighbor, what's up? <laughs> so it's bringing people together. Do you think Veterans on Patrol is bringing more people together? I think they're trying as hard as they can. I'm not sure if they completely get all of the culture that's out here because if you're going to break people down into de different demographics out here you got people that are nomads you got people so that you are think hobos. maybe if i you wasn't the homeless you got the if i wasn't place. a veteran and i'd be walking by and i'd see veterans on patrol i might not think it applies to me is that what you're saying well it's like to some of the homeless out here you got all these flags you got all these guns it seems aggressive. But no, in reality, in practice, is it aggressive? It's not aggressive, it's protective. Okay. It's making sure the flags are there to know that this is about freedom, this is about one people, one country. So if you were homeless and you were watching this video, what would you tell the uh, say someone homeless on the street that was needing help about veterans on patrol? I would say that you got good concerns, but it's definitely something worth looking more into, and it might be something that benefits you. So at, put away your fear and, and walk on right. up and see what's going on? Bill, it's like engage the people in your neighborhood. Okay. Just like if you're in a home and you see someone who's not as well off on you, engage them as your neighbor. Not necessarily as someone down on their luck. Or someone on opposing sides. Right. Just engage them as if they were family? Right. Okay.
because it's like when it comes down to it, that's what we are. Yeah. It's In like one way or, or, or another. That's it's like if Lewis needs me, I'm going to be here. If you need help with something you're doing over there, I'm going to uh, try to be there. Unless I prove it otherwise. Unless right. I prove that I'm a big jerk and maybe it's not. Well, deserving even if of you're me. a jerk, I might show up. Depending on how much of a jerk I was. <laughs> well, it's like... I, I won't help everyone if I... People make if, mistakes, and yeah. people tend to make bad decisions. Now, if someone's being a jerk, I still might uh, show up. So, I... Because... You believe in forgiveness? I believe in forgiveness, but I also believe in being the better... Or to being the bigger person. So, you, you believe in, in actually... Concentrating on your action versus paying attention to someone else's right. bad actions. Because if I let so if I fall into someone else's bad actions, I'm proving their model. I'm proving what they're saying. But if you keep that positive impact even in the face of someone else's bad actions, you're hoping to reap a positive right. benefit. Okay. And it's like, it's knowing that when we're talking about any demographic, there's your people that are doing so much good because they want to show there's good people in that demographic and that we're all going through the same thing and we're all about the same thing, that they're not paying attention to anything else. So do you, you, are, got, you sum that up by saying we're all just people, regardless right. of our, our demographics and ideologies and political affiliations? Yeah. Okay. And it's like, a, it's like I might be a homeless activist, but that doesn't mean that if you're some kind of other activist, I can't be there. Well, I, I, I know that in, in true in action. Um, you were in the Occupy movement. You're more liberal-leaning. I had a Tea Party event. You guys, you and John showed up. You got a part of the conversation and, and went out there and, and did it without fear. So, uh, right, and it's like... You one, proved that in action to me. Right, and it's like one thing I found out about the... Uh, found out a long time ago is when it comes to the Occupy when it comes to the Tea Party both groups are about accountability both of them are about empowering the person both of them are about investing in the American people both of them are about making America what it should be not what it currently is. So you see a lot of uh, a lot of things. You see a lot of points where both of those two contrasting groups agree on. Right, and that if that's where we agree, that's where we build. Maybe that's where we need to have our focus and not focus on what we disagree right. on to cause the right. division. Right, and so it's like part of what I tell city council and I tell government, uh, different people in government and businesses is what do we agree on because let's talk about that right let's not let's put aside what we disagree on let's talk about what we do agree right. on and build on that and then let's take about oh the stuff that we agree on and let's see how the stuff we come up for that helps our ideas of what we don't agree on. Okay, so it's it's building coalitions on what we agree on and then discussing what we don't agree on to see where we come up right. with, but do it with respect? Right, because it's like, it's like, the people here at BOP might be more conservative than I am, but it's like part of the whole thing is whatever your politics is, you keep it off the property. Do you think you and agree so, with the, the VOP more than you disagree with them on most things, uh, being contrasting ideologies? I think they're doing exactly what needs to be done, where it needs to be done. Awesome. And I think that the people driving the will are the right people for the job at this exact time. So you definitely put 100% support behind what they're doing. Right.
Okay, yes, cool. Guys, and if it takes a few guns to make it safe, it takes a few American flags to show people what America is really about. Or should be about. Right. You know, part of the thing that you need to remember is we think sometimes that the flag represents the government that is the imperial government. But it's at the same time, that's not their flag, it's our flag. What, what you're describing is kind of the contrast, one of the things that is contrasting with the Occupy movement and the Tea Party movement, where the Tea Party movement holds the flag in pride, where the Occupy movement will use the flag and even deface it in protest. Right. Because but that shouldn't divide the two parties. Well, it's like, it's all based on perception, and perception's the big battle. Because when it comes down to it, it's just a piece of cloth flying in the wind. But it's what each one of us perceive and believe that gives it meaning. Some people want to look at the imperialistic aspect. Other people want to say it doesn't represent that. It represents freedom. And it's my flag. But both and together, both, both groups seem to... If you put both groups together, it would seem like on one aspect it would it would talk out against the negative part of of Amer being American and Americanism, and then also promoting the positive part. So, right. okay, okay. And so it's like, a, whatever you want to do with the flag, do what you want with it. It's your freedom. Well, I prefer freedom. I definitely right. And do. I prefer freedom, and it's like, the more you take my rights away, the more you start the path to take your own. Right. I My agree. freedom is guaranteed in you being free. When you restrict the rights of others, you don't you indirectly are gonna restrict right. your own rights in the long and run. And it's like we should be able to have an intellectual conversation without getting emotionally charged. Well, when you get angry, when right. you get mad, it seems to you're almost drunk. It seems to blind you. Right. But it's like the when it comes to both political I, ideologies both of them it's about getting utopia it's just two different routes to get there one might be more scenic one might be direct i don't believe in the uh, in a utopia like that we would actually achieve a utopia i got to get my buddy home he's at time for his nap soon so yeah i'm going to just ask anthony here is there is there anything uh, that, that you wanted to include in this interview or anything else that you, you feel that you need to say at this time? I would say, I would just say definitely keep tuning in to the Tillman News Network. And I would say if you have an idea and you want to do something, the only thing stopping you is that butt in the chair. So the only thing stopping you is yourself. Right. So overcome whatever fears would overcome any anxieties and, and go out there and make a positive impact right. in the At world. At least talk to people about it. Go right to the source and find out what the real story is. Right. Okay. Anthony, always a pleasure, yeah. man. Thank you very much Thank for you. the interview. Awesome. Rational. Propaganda. Media. Radio.